So often when putting together a Seattle Philharmonic program, uh, there might be an ulterior motive of some kind. And in recent years, I've been happily experimenting with different sonorities occupying the same two hour concert space. And in this case, I decided to take a bit of a gamble and also to give uh, my string players a much deserved break. And so the strings are only going to be heard in the second half of the concert on which we play the Beethoven Symphony No. 6, the Pastoral Symphony. The first half of the concert is going to be entirely the province of the percussion, the woodwinds, and the brasses. We're going to begin the concert with a piece of music that I've known since I was a small child, one of those wonderful, weird, esoteric pieces that I came to know courtesy of my parents' uh, library of recordings. My father was in the stereo electronics business and was forever coming home with armfuls of uh, then brand new LPs and reel-to-reel -reel tapes uh, that he'd been given as samples at various stereo shows. And he brought home a reel-to-reel -reel tape of music for percussion ensemble uh, directed by a man named Paul Price. And the entire album was percussion, uh, both pitched and unpitched. And the very first number on the album was a prelude for percussion by a gentleman named Malloy Miller. It's just one of those pieces that I've always wanted to do and thought that given the special nature of this concert where we were going to do everything without strings for the first half, this would be a, a lovely forum on which to play this piece. Uh, it's uh, for six players who between them are, uh, are all doubly occupied. None of the players plays only one instrument in the course of the piece. They all have to play at least two, if not more, uh, items from the percussion battery. And uh, several notable things about the piece, uh, one of them is that virtually the whole melodic content of the piece is based on fourths. Uh, that would be the interval from here to here. So that even though there are a lot of unpitched percussion in the piece, there's bass drum, snare drum, cymbals, uh, he does use a glockenspiel, xylophone, timpani, so there are a few members of the pitched percussion family. And uh, when we first get the semblance of anything like a theme, uh, it's the glockenspiel playing all fourths and fifths. And a fifth is nothing more than a fourth turned upside down. So the very first theme, per se, that you hear is So all fourths and fifths. Uh, and then there's a somewhat more aggressive theme that comes in in the xylophone, which is. So fully exploiting the idea of fourths as uh, the sources of these melodic chunks. Uh, another fun thing about the piece, there are some composers who delight in um, presenting music that sounds like it's in a time which it isn't. Uh, I'm thinking of a piece like the, um, the G minor Slavonic dance from the first set of Slavonic dances of Dvorak. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you would tend to think that it's one, two, three, and one, da, da, two, da, three, da, da, one, two, three, da, one, da, 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 da. But it turns out that it's in fact one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, dee, ba, 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 bum, ba, da, dum, bum, ba, da, dum, dee, ba, 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 bum, ba, da, da, bum. So similarly, uh, the Malloy Miller prelude for percussion, if you were tapping your toes to it, you'd be forgiven if it sounds like it was in a straight two. Yum, ba, da, 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 and uh, in fact, uh, it's in three, which forces the players to sort of feel it one way but think it another, and it really keeps them on their toes. So uh, a, a conductor's pattern is one, two, three, one, two, three. So that is the real meter. So against that, it's yum. So very clearly a feeling of two 
against the authentic three. So uh, it's very interesting melodically, harmonically, rhythmically, uh, and says everything that it has to say in a very compact five or six minutes or so. Richard Strauss is primarily known for the pieces that he wrote in his maturity as a composer, the great operas like Salome, Electra, De Rosenkavalier, uh, the uh, clutch of incredible symphonic poems, Don Juan, Don Quixote, Macbeth, Ein Heldenleben, also Svrach Zarathustra, uh, etc., etc., etc. Uh, and it's easy to forget that he was an incredibly precocious youth. His father was a very fine horn virtuoso. A lot of people think that, that uh, Strauss is having grown up around the sound of the horn is one of the reasons why, uh, in particular, his horn parts in his orchestra works shown. This little suite that we're doing for winds is, I believe, a product of his 17th or 18th year. Uh, it's, uh, it's a younger, somewhat more innocent Strauss uh, before he became thoroughly enamored of the very heady, tempting, sensuous world of Wagner and the other progressive romantics. Uh, there's almost as much of a Brahms feel to this early piece as there is to the, the latent uh, ultra-romantic that Strauss was to be. So, so even though he was very young when he wrote it, it's quite a pivotal work. The one thing that is already absolutely locked in place is this man's unbelievable and uncanny ear for sonority. Uh, every instrument has a chance to shine, and whether he's using only a few instruments within the ensemble, or the entire mass of them, or one or two of them uh, etching out a solo line against an accompaniment, uh, the orchestration is foolproof. So he must have been born with an absolutely unbelievable ear, as you will hear in this very early uh, effort of his. George Frederick Handel is one of those strange cases where uh, if you were to ask people to name the 15, 20 greatest composers who ever lived, he would probably be on most of those lists. We tend to think uh, Mozart, Bach, Beethoven, Handel, Haydn, Schubert, Schumann, etc., etc. And yet, considering his immense output, and it really was immense and formidable, I've, I've yet to meet a Handel piece I didn't like, and whether it's one of the lesser-known concerti grossi or one of the uh, overtures to one of his uh, oratorios or operas, everything is worth hearing. And uh, Handel had no less an immense fan than Beethoven. Uh, the name of this concert is, To Him I Bend the Knee. That is actually a quote from Beethoven, uh, who said, depending on which translation of the quote that you read, uh, Handel was the most skilled, the ablest, the most phenomenal composer who ever lived. And Beethoven was certainly familiar with the outputs of Bach, of Mozart, of Haydn. Uh, but to him, Handel was, was the musical god, the one that he held in the highest esteem. Uh, when Beethoven was uh, at the very end of his life, on his deathbed, uh, a very wealthy friend sent to him uh, a beautiful bound collection of the works of Handel. And it is said that uh, during the last weeks of his life, he was studying Handel till the very end and treasuring these, these volumes that he'd received as a, a very welcome gift. And uh, as to Mr. Beethoven, it's a pleasure to return to the Pastoral Symphony. It's uh, certainly one of the most popular of the nine, probably as much for programmatic reasons as for its incredible musical worth. It was undoubtedly given a little bit of a boost when it was included in Walt Disney's uh, film Fantasia in 1940 uh, in a somewhat edited uh, performance uh, because there was only so much time that they could devote to any one piece, um, but magically performed by Leopold Stokowski and the Philadelphia Orchestra. There is uh, a story possibly apocryphal, although a lot of people swore that it was true, that uh, played up the fact that Walt Disney, while a genius in his field of uh, animated films, simply did not know a lot about classical music. He was entirely in the hands of Stokowski and his other musical advisors when it came to Fantasia because he didn't know anything about the music, how it was constructed, um, its place in the world. And the legend has it that um, one day, Disney was shown the rough cut of the pastoral symphony sequence, the one with all the cherubs and Bacchus and all those people. 
And uh, apparently after it was done, he marveled at it. He just thought for a minute and he turned to his animators. He said, you know, this movie is gonna make Beethoven. As if Beethoven needed the assist, but that's the way the story goes. As I've been restudying the piece, uh, I've found some wonderful things in it, as one invariably does with uh, a masterpiece. No matter how many times you return to a great piece, there will always be new things in it. And something um, occurred to me for the very first time this go-around. Uh, this is Beethoven, remember. This is the man who could do so much with so little. Uh, this is a man who constructed not only a, a first movement, but an entire symphony out of the notion of short, 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 long. The whole Fifth Symphony is a series of, of variations and permutations of da 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 da, all through it. And I was wondering if uh, anything would come to the fore this time studying the Pastoral Symphony, and darned if it didn't. Something that I'd never noticed before. And I first encountered it in the slow movement, the scene by the brook. Uh, in the second violins, violas, and cellos, we have So this, this notion of And then when I was studying the storm movement, uh, I remember we've gone from a brook, which has to do with water, to a storm, also very waterlogged music. Um, when the second violins come in with their little threatening storm figure, Listen to those first seven notes. So he's making uh, almost a, a pun on the one water theme to the, the other deluge of water in this movement. Uh, and similarly, when the storm finally goes away, giving way to the final movement where all the peasants rejoice at the fact that good weather has returned, um, we have this almost prayer-like version uh, of that very same theme. And if my score would stay open, I could maybe play it for you. together in those same seven notes. <laughs> 